seems like really all over the place. Um, I still find it so fascinating how this digital format now allows us to get together and sort of bridge the geographical distance and, and time difference, um, New York, Berlin. Yeah, but now I'm, I'm thrilled to be moderating um, today's conversation with Samuel Bich, um, an artist and publisher from Berlin and a friend, and Max Schumann, um, also an artist, but here today, of course, in his uh, function as the executive director of Printed Matter, and um, certainly one of the greatest experts on Printed Matter's history, so I'm really glad to talk to you both. Um, but that's it for bios. Um, you're very welcome to read um, longer ones on the events page if, you, if you're interested. I'm going to jump right into conversation and I'd like to start by actually showing you what we're here <laughs> to celebrate um, or to, to present and launch today and that is Samuel's latest publication um, and Margaret already read out the title, the very long title, <laughs> uh, Catalog Artist Books, <laughs> uh, Printed Matter, 1976 to 2020, $48.66. And um, for everyone familiar, or even just a little bit familiar with the history of Printed Matter, um, and I'm sure there's a lot of you um, in the audience, you'll know 1976 was the year in which Printed Matter was founded in by a group of seven individuals. Um, these first board members were uh, Lucy Laparte, Solowit, uh, Walter Robinson, Edith Diak, Mimi Wheeler, Robin White, and Pat Steer. Um, and I'm sure we'll come back to some of these names later on in conversation um, with Max maybe. Um, so in, in, in summary, just to start, um, this catalog concludes a non-comprehensive list of artist books distributed by Printed Matter in the years, in the 44 year time span between 1976 and 2020. Um, and the price mentioned below is not only the price the books being sold for in the US, but it is also um, the result of a hypothetical calculation of sorts. Um, Sam uh, took all of the artist books prices listed in Printed Matters online catalog, because this is where he data mined his information from. And uh, he divided this total amount um, by the number of books in the catalog and um, concluded that this figure was the average price of an artist book. But we'll talk more about that later as well. Um, as for now, I'm going to hand over to Sam and he'll kick us off with a short introduction to what the book's about and also to um, how it relates to your overall publishing practice. So stage is yours. Sam. Yeah, thanks, Regine. Thanks for the introduction and especially for your encouragement and help in setting this book launch up. I'm really glad about that. And also I want to thank you, Margaret and Max, for hosting us at Printed Matter. Um, actually, there could hardly be any better place for that. Now I just need to share my screen. Okay. I didn't always see my books in the field of artist books. To me, they were rather exhibitions, sculptures or interventions. Calling them books always implied to me, at least to some degree, that specific dimensions or possibilities of the medium were simply taken for granted and not addressed by the work. The term itself became used inflationary somehow. So I think that making certain claims that expand the medium's specificity or possibilities could be very productive. All examples I will talk about are printed manifestations of digital archives of certain institutions, museums, libraries, etc. The books were on display at least for some time at the place where the source material originates from. First, I will talk about the printed matter book, and then shortly re related to two older publications of mine, one about the Kunsthalle in Vienna, which is from 2017, and one which is about the library of the University of the Arts in Berlin. Printed matter was always well known to me as an international platform and distributor of artist books. But what I wasn't aware of, at least for quite some time, was that Lucy Lepard and Solowit were among the founding members of it. So with Lucy Lepard, who was later called the first historian of conceptual art, and Solowit, who substantially contributed to the understanding 
of the term with its 1967 art forum essay, paragraphs on conceptual art, the printed matter board included two main protagonists of that time. With this in mind, the printed matter book was a way for me to combine my general interest in conceptual art and reference to key figures of the field in one work. In the case of the printed matter book, I copied the complete online inventory of the categories and subcategories of catalog, books, artist books, including all out of stock items, like you can see on the slide. Then I sorted them, starting with the least recent books. After saying this, it becomes quite obvious that the title also derives from this hierarchical categories. This order allowed me to put the title of my own book as a seemingly logical end to the already existing list of books. The layout of the book relied heavily on the corporate identity of the web page. I took the same layout with the six columns and the typeface is also identical. For the sake of consistency, I deleted all other available information except for the artist's names, the work titles and their price. For some items, I held on to the given additional media information if they weren't just a book, but also included an audio file, like the tag audio and video, for example. The price of the book is the average amount of all artist books available in the online catalog up to the date the printed matter book was produced, which is January the 12th of 2020. Maybe this should be enough to it for now. We can still go into details with questions later with the printed matter book. Now I just shortly want to relate the catalog to another book I made on the occasion of the exhibition publishing as an artistic toolbox 1989 until 2017 in Vienna. The work's title is Kunst Wien 1992 until 2017. This book comprising all exhibitions at the Kunst Halle Vienna since its founding in 1992 Again, sourcing the information from the Kunsthalle's online archive. On this slide, you can see four screenshots from the old webpage of the Kunsthalle Vienna. Since 2019, there are new directors, which also meant they got a completely new page. Every page of the book represents, in chronological order, one exhibition at the Kunsthalle from its founding until the, until the date that this book was on display as part of the exhibition publishing as an artistic toolbox 1989 until 2017. The design of the book reflects the corporate identity of the Kunsthalle and adopts both its typeface as well as the system of color coding used in the archive. The name of the book appears on the last page of the book, suggesting that my cataloged history of the Kunsthalle was the latest show at the Kunsthalle Vienna. In this way, the book is both a solo show by myself, as well as it is a printed copy of the exhibition archive at the Kunsthalle, Vienna from 1992 until 2017, and itself a part of the group exhibition publishing as an artistic toolbox. The last proje project I want to briefly talk about is also the first book I did that related to a specific side. It is from 2015 and is on permanent view at the Library of the University of the Arts in Berlin. The book's title is E Künstlerinnen und Künstler, which just translates into B artists in English. It lists in alphabetical order all artists whose last name starts with the letter B and whose books are held in the library of the Berlin University of Arts. Every page in the book is devoted to the name of one artist. At first sight, the surname's first letter seems to be missing, but it appears in the upper corner of every page it always being the same letter B. The typography and color of the book again refers strongly to the library's own corporate identity. In German, it pr produces this zooming in sequence of Berlin, Bibliothek, Buch, Bich, which doesn't work as well in English with Berlin Library, Book, Bich. Ultimately, it leads to the page with my own name on it, which just says Ich, which meaning, in I, uh, meaning I in German. I donated the book to the library of the Berlin University of Arts, where it's permanent on display. Okay, back to you, Regine, thanks. Thank you, brilliant, Sam. Uh, I think this really helped in showing that this strategy um, 
of working with an institution's archive or inventory is really central to your uh, practice, um, as you've shown with these earlier publishing projects. So in direct response to your presentation, there's a few issues I'd like to um, elaborate on a little further and maybe starting with this analogy of the book and the exhibition um, that you talked about at the very beginning of your presentation. Um, actually on the first page of the catalog um, on the inside here, <laughs> you call it an exhibition um, where you say, this book is a catalog of all the artist books from Printed Matter as well as an exhibition of the archive um, itself. And um, maybe I should mention that this is also how we too started our conversation in 2017, uh, when you had just published the Kunsthalle uh, Vienna book, I think, and you reached out to me yeah. um, because of the um, overlaps with my PhD research. And I guess one of the issues that we're both um, quite interested in is um, a very open understanding of the concept of um, an exhibition as a practice of making public. Um, so this definition naturally puts the exhibition in some proximity to the publication. Um, yeah, so but how, how does this idea of the book as exhibition come into play in your work? Yeah, as you already said, it's maybe some this kind of literal understanding of the exhibition form, or like this term exhibition, like bringing into the public and having this etymological kind of parallel to the publishing practice. So to me, this allowed me to think about this, making those books as kind of like reflecting on the format of the exhibition at the same time. So those books enable, or like they have some special qualities like the exhibition doesn't have. They have those, for example, on the, ex on the example of the printed matter book, there's this time span of 1976 until 2020, those 44 years that is, that you usually also have in, ex in an exhibition, but then there's also this own temporality of the book itself, which is easily over hundred years. So, and then there's additional to this temp temporal dimension of the book, there's also this spatial mobility a book has, which is also quite special. And thinking about those two kind of parameters is quite, I mean, uh, enlightening somehow <laughs> to the idea of the exhibition sometimes. I mean, it's different. I mean, I'm sitting here in Berlin. I made this whole book from here. And then there is like this viewer in the printed matter bookshop. I mean, I don't actually, I don't know if you could actually go there right now, but actually, okay. Yeah, you can actually stay in the shop and flip through the book and have all those references you actually look at or read around yourself. So, I mean, this having this in mind, and then you can, of course, buy it and bring it to your home, read it in your easy chair or in your bed. Then you have those kind of, I mean, just imaginative kind of references, which is also kind of another reference, which is maybe more a classical kind of reading uh, mode. So it's, I mean, this kind of relationship between this temporal and uh, spatial kind of dimensions what I think is the most interesting thing in kind of thinking about books as exhibitions somehow. Thank you, yeah. I think what became clear um, from what you already said and also from your presentation is that um, uh, this is not a scholarly, um, like a serious scholarly anthology or publication, um, despite being a great resource um, of, for historical names and, and facts, um, but mainly really this is an artist book um, consisting of um, raw data. Um, and I'd like to ask you, um, because you included a lot of, you included and left all of the typos just as you found them. And there's some irregularities when you found them in the online catalog, you just left them um, as is. Um, could you elaborate a little bit on why you decided not to make um, these edits or corrections um, and to really just keep the information, the data as raw as it is? Yeah, I mean, I mean, I just reduced the, the, I mean, basic information of every book to like the name, title and the price, which is already like an editing process somehow. But 
I need, I mean, I know what you mean, like this kind of, um, I mean, this not correcting like mistakes I found or like also realizing that the chronology is not really like working in that way, like it's not a strict chronology in it, but somehow what I really liked about this idea, like, I mean, it's, it, of course it would be like a really big load of work to do that. I mean, it's a bit crazy. It's around 9,000 books or maybe close to 10,000 books and to correct every title of artists I not even have heard of and which is already kind of just to correct the names is already difficult. So, and then I thought it's nice because all the books are kind of, they were on analog at some point and were transferred into the digital because like I just copied like this online inventory. So actually a physical person just typed in the names into the system. So I thought it's kind of me coming and then copying all the digital data and bringing it back into an analog format is kind of like another way to implement like mistakes of myself. And then I thought it's kind of a nice snapshot of a moment, so, so hard to say, some, so to say, and it's kind of more than it's like a history of printed, like representative history of printed matter. It's probably more like a representative history of uh, like me meta history of the online inventory system <laughs> or something like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, I agree. And it would have changed the nature of the book completely. Yeah, if you if you would have. Um, yeah, I mean, make corrections once where, where do you start? Um, but um, just like in the, the Kunsthalle Vienna book, um, and that's the last thing I want to bring up is um, you listed your own catalog at the end of this list. So really on the last page, just to show everyone, you probably can't read this, but Samuel's um, catalog artist book is listed in the very same um, uh, catalog. And it strikes me as uh, an act of um, maybe self positioning or self historicizing almost. Um, um, so just provocatively asking, do you see yourself as continuing that legacy of the artists um, included in the catalog? <laughs> I mean, I mean, somehow it's like in all those books I was just talking about. It's always there's my name in it, but it's always somehow a little different, like like what it actually means or so. But also, it's somehow all always the same in some way. But in, I mean, I was looking for a practice that I could just kind kind of keep up doing on, like just kind I could work on even I don't have an invitation for an exhibition or something. So it was also like the books were also tools for me kind of to introduce myself to specific institutions or something. I mean, I also kind of admired and to some degree the work of Andrei Kadere, this kind of Polish artist who always showed up with those wooden, annoying wooden sticks and uh, left them in the exhibitions of his friends. So. But I, what, I, what I thought about this practice is that it's, all, that it's so aggressive, like this gesture of just showing up and leaving something like physically, like, so I thought it's kind of, how could I do it differently? And now, like with putting my name in it, it was also in one way, it was kind of a way of, in the case of rejection of the institution, it, it was for me to kind of calm myself down. It's like, ah, I'm already part of it anyway don't need you or something and then on the other way it was kind of like a proposition with like a hidden agenda or something I made to them and like or to the different uh, institutions or like maybe it's just like an in a kind introduction somehow it it, it reminded what you just said reminded me of um there's a quote by Robert Barry uh what's the least amount of presentation I can get away with and yeah. I think in one of our earlier conversations you also um, brought up the idea of taking a shortcut and uh -huh. um, so I, I think what you're doing really is it's in, it's very interesting because you're inscribing yourself into a history while writing it <laughs> and as much as I think this is ingenious it's also a little bit cheeky or sneaky because you're coming in through the back door rather than the front um, <laughs> of sorts so 
yeah, it, I mean, it's la one last obvious question. How do you like the term institutional critique in regards to your work? Oh, <laughs> probably the most di difficult questions you could ask, or question you could ask. I mean, it's tricky. Um, actually, I, it's even hard to say what institutional critique is still. To me, it's more like a historical like format somehow, like conceptual art is or something, like it's bound to a specific time. Or although I don't know in how far this term is helpful, I just recently talked to a friend about it and she just say, just said like something like build your own institution. I mean, it's implying of course that uh, we don't do the same mistakes again. And in that, uh, like in that context, like this kind of critique is of course somehow productive if it still happens and gets kind of reimbursed in the system somehow but and I mean let's in some way it's kind of like the complete opposite what I'm doing I mean I'm reproducing all the inequalities that already happen in the institutions I'm actually copying all the rejections I'm actually uh, I mean I'm yeah it's actually somehow the worst you can do but on the other hand it's still somehow pointing to exactly those gatekeeping kind of uh, functions or like politics of exactly those institutions and in, in that I mean that's more like I see it and it's that sense it's I nev would never say I'm doing institutional critique I would rather say I'm commenting the, on an institution or something and I mean in the yeah and but yeah <laughs> yeah, yeah. you're definitely questioning um the institution and I think it's high time now to include Max into this conversation. <laughs> Hi Max. <laughs> um, when we had a chat a couple of uh, days ago and you're still muted, muted by the way, um, you already enlightened us um, about some of the questions we had uh, in regards you know about the introdu uh, introduction um, of the computer system at Printed Matter in the 1980s um, and this really being the reason why some of the early artist books um, are not listed in the online catalog um, because they had already sold out by the time you went computer. Um, and I was wondering if maybe you could um, explain that process again in a bit more detail um, and also including how your inventory was kept record of um, before the computer system. Um, yeah, happily. Um, but first, I'd just like to respond a little bit to, to Sam's book and project and some of the things that were said. I mean, it, I first when I first saw it, I was completely mystified um, because it was, you know, this uh, all this these lists and names and titles and prices that I am so familiar with, but with these huge emissions in data. And it was like, what was the how was this organized? How was this? Why is it presented like this? Where's the alph alphabetization? Where's the chronology? Where's the, in other words, there's a really, and, and, and that's what it remains. It's, it's not, it's absolutely not a, um, you know, a, a scholarly resource. It's a conceptual project. And, um, and it very much, you know, uh, calls into question and, 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 and forces you to examine and grapple with, you know, um, systems of classification and bibliographic ordering and things like that. So I think it's a very interesting and compelling project, uh, but it's not a resource book. It's an artist book. It's a true artist project. And I love the idea of it as an exhibition and publications as an exhibition. And indeed, I love that picture or uh, uh, visualizing a person reading Sam's book in printed matter as a kind of performance piece. Um, and, you know, the one that is in conversation with all the material and, and uh, uh, in, in interacts and exchanges with you know, its environment in a, in a kind of complete total circle way. Um, but then, yeah, I mean, I guess just to provide further <laughs> some further context regarding that, I pulled a few things that were in different piles and, and from archive things we have in our desk and uh, printed matter uh, didn't, its inventory didn't go, um, wasn't computerized until 1986. So from 1976 to 1986, everything was recorded in um, card catalog format. And I actually have a portion of that. Um, this is Printed Matters old card catalog system. That's how it was tracked all of its inventory. 
And this is um, artists M through Z. So this would constitute, I'm not exactly sure what year this is. I haven't looked at it that closely, but I imagine it's uh, early mid eighties. And um, so the inventory would have been kept probably in around three of these, of these size uh, uh, cases. And this is a system when we looked at it together and I was reminded of it, um, it's, a, it's a sales recording. So let me see. Let me maybe pull something out that might be familiar. Well, I have no idea who this is. And Mr. Mental, Systemic Art. Um, but it's interesting because it's um, multiple pages that are stapled together, um, recording different periods. The price of the book is at the time. Oh, I know, it's different titles from the same supplier. That's what you have. And this is a sales record. So what's missing is a shipment received record as well as a consignment calculation because those are the basic bits of data that you need to be able to carry books on consignment and pay the artist for them. You have to record the number of books received, then you sell them, you have to record the sales and then you have to calculate how much you owe the supplier. So I mean, a large part of our archive was lost in the flood and um, um, and this is one part of it that has, that has, that has survived. Um, but I, they could be that elsewhere, I think elsewhere in our archive, I could find records of some of that missing data, but you can see it's really cool. There's another one where it has the crosshatch system, you know, where it's like one, two, three, four, five with the crosshatch through to count the different sales. Um, so that's how it was organized beforehand. And then, and then printed matter went into a R-based computer system that was custom made in 1986. And, um, and then since then we've gone on to two different um, computer systems, one in 2000, uh, where all the data from the previous um, system was, was you know, uh, uh, converted to. And then that happened again. The last one was around 2011 or something like that. Um, yeah, so um, we have, I mean, not like in our current system, not the entire sales and shipment legacy going back to 1986 is retained, but we do have an archival computer database where we can see every, all the different inventory supplier customers and transactions that were done since 1986 since we went onto computers. So there is a pretty good data legacy going back to 86, but before 86, there was none. So. The books that are in Sam's list are books that um, that we carried from 1986 onward. Many of those books are books that we started carrying in 1976 because they were restocked and reshipped. So it's a pretty comprehensive list of all of Printed Matter's inventory. What it's missing is the books that we received between 1976 and sold out of or discontinued for whatever reason before it went to a, into computer in 1986. The only place where those records exist is either in these card catalogs or in Printed Matters history of, of mail order catalogs, which this is an example of. Is it showing backwards? No, it's fine. Uh, okay. So this is the first, to my knowledge, this is the first uh, mail order flyer that Printed Matter ever did. Uh, the address on it, oh no, sorry, not that one, this one here. Um, the address on it is 105 Hudson Street before Printed Matter was a storefront, which was called the Fine Arts Building in Tribeca, and which was like an 11 story um, kind of industrial building that housed a whole bunch of different galleries and art projects and studios, um, including that's where Artist Space was, was started and New Museum was started as well. And uh, Printed Matter later moved to its first storefront in 1978 um, on Les Bernard Street. But basically the mail order catalog, so this is really before Printed Matter had a retail space. And the mail order catalogs were really central to the founder's vision of, of artist books and, and, and why and, and how they should function and why we need them. And they really saw them like mail order being a, the mail aspect of artist books being a super important aspect of their um, accessibility. Um, 
and that you didn't have to be in an urban center to um, experience and receive this, these experimental works of art in published form, but that anyone could get them anywhere. Um, Decentralization, yeah. Yeah, and just to show you a few, I mean, and I think like the, like the printed matter, cat. so, so again, the um, printed matters, you know, bibliographic history can really be retraced and reconstructed through these things. So this is just a small sampling. And you see these, there's books like some of the holy grails of collecting. Like I think there was Burning Small Fires by Bruce Nauman for like $6 <laughs> that now sells for like $10,000 or something like that. Um, um, and other things at their current prices. Um, but a testimony to their, I think to their achievement of the artist book you know project and that making art in an industrial type of production to be broadly disseminated like an ordinary commodity at affordable prices burning small fires for most of its life was a very inexpensive publication that many people could get and then it's when the kind of marketplace the aura of artists genius and commodity fetishism you know kind of usurped that and its scarcity and whatever desirability by a collecting class um, drove its prices um, to very inaccessible levels. Um, this is the first flyer to my knowledge from Lisbon Art Street. Um, again, a very simple uh, utilitarian pamphlet. Um, and that's when we had our first storefront. But a number of the catalogs, there's this kind of amazing, uh, I think uh, kind of aesthetic legacy of the catalogs as well. Some of them are really beautiful. This one may have been designed by Saul Lewitt. It's another early one, it's in red. And it's a format that Printed Matter did a bunch of times. The reason why I say that is because there was a early poster of Printed Matter using the same um, uh, typeface and, and, uh, color, uh, and, and color scheme that was kind of anecdotally attributed to, to Lewitt. Um, but it's just beautiful in the kind of revolutionary red. And then it folds out into a full size poster with quite a, in very small type, with a really wonderful selection of the artist books at the time. So there's probably a good, you know, possibly even 150 or 200 titles in this. And then another one, just to quickly show the variation in designs. I didn't even know this existed until about four or five years ago, this one, spend money it says. So it has kind of like a theme. I'm not sure who designed it but there's this backdrop of yellow type, which alternates between spend money, treasure, maybe that's it, spend money and treasure. Yeah, so really an artist book in its own right. Um, and then Printed Matter did some more substantial ones. This is a very early one. It's, and then it's just beautiful. It has this very kind of minimal design with uh, very carefully chosen images, simple utilitarian layout again. Um, and there's a number of these in this rectangular shape that came out over the years. And then just to quickly, one of these the, catalogs. sorry. You might have one of the catalogs that you wanted to show us as well. If yeah, I mean, these are all, we call them flyers slash catalogs. And then the big ones, this was an appeal to librarians that was put together by Clive Philpott who had joined Printed Matters board and was the new director of MoMA's library and kind of um, critical to the develop of their expansive and one of the largest and, and probably broadest uh, collections of contemporary artist books. So it's an appeal to librarians to recognize this as its own kind of special category of books. And um, that was kind of a big campaign that Printed Matter and others were involved in is kind of like legitimizing or having librarians recognize artist books as like a, a feature of publishing that needed to kind of be recognized and, 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 and represented within, you know, um, libraries and archives. And then there was a series of like full length catalogs. So this from 1981, there's probably, you know, it's like a hundred and something pages, beautifully illustrated with some different curated selections, thematic selections of books. And in this would probably be a good 
number of the books that may be missing from Sam's books. And um, this one, I think, appropriately shows uh, mailboxes as the cover. I'm not sure how it, how it was designed. And there's an addenda. And there were artists who contributed. Peter Downsborough did one of the early printed matter catalog designs. Barbara Kruger did this one, uh, catalog addenda. Mike Lear did another one. And the last full print catalog before Printed Matter went online um, was a uh, cover designed by Louise Lawler. This is a kind of a faded, faded copy. But I just wanted to show that as another representation of Printed Matter's inventory that resides in the catalog and that it's, it's um, and here there is, you know, those missing pieces of information and, and it's kind of the, that would be the bibliographic resource for that kind of work, which Sam's is not, it's a different project altogether, but a fascinating one at that. Definitely. I mean, yeah, the, the inventory or the inventory system is so crucial to how Printed Matter works. You called it the, and I hope I get it right, the nuts and bolts of um, how the business was run. And nuts and bolts. <laughs> your words <laughs> from yeah. uh, this amazing panel on the um, founding and early history of Printed Matter at Judson Church in 2015. And for everyone, if you want to rewatch it, there's a um, a video on Printed Matters YouTube um, channel. It includes lots of the early founding members and I highly recommend it. Um, but yeah, regarding that early inventory system and the card catalogs that you just showed in the beginning, I would really like to um, give some credit to um, a woman called Irina von Zahn or Irina von Zahn. She was Printed Matters um, first store manager in 1976. And apparently um, she was instrumental in setting up um, the inventory system. So I was um, trying to get in touch with her in preparation um, of this talk. Um, so I first contacted Rene Bloch um, because she had worked for his gallery before joining Printed Matter. But he told me he lost touch with her um, when she left um, because she left New York in the late 70s, um, or she left the art world, um, basically, for Virginia. And so eventually I got in touch with um, one of her sisters, Camilla Koenen, and over the phone she um, sadly confirmed to me that um, Irina Fonsan had passed away already in 2013, aged 67. And um, yeah, this made me quite sad because I think she has not been talked about as much in the early history of Printed Matter. Um, and I would have loved to include her in this conversation somehow. Um, Max, is there anything that you remember about Irina? Um, or was she really just not, she left the art world? And, and yeah, I, I never met her, or to my knowledge, I never met her. Um, I'm not sure when she left New, New York and the, the New York art world. Did you have a date on that? Was it in the late 70s? Um, but I mean, as early as the late seventies. I mean, I've asked about her many times because she's in our, you know, she's in our kind of historical literature and stuff like that, and our correspondences and and early, you know, uh, institutional, you know, documents. And I am, you know, in touch and close to Nancy Lynn, who was one of the early directors who definitely knew Irina. And Nancy, I think, to my memory, was like, yeah, she totally disappeared off the face of the earth. She left the art world. She left New York. And I forget whether there were attempts to reach out to her. I feel like there may have been, but um, there's, uh, there's, to my knowledge, there's really been no contact with her. But at that, at that Judson Church panel um, that we did, it was in, uh, it was in, it was on the occasion of this exhibition, um, uh, "Learn to Read Art: The Surviving History of Printed Matter," that we showed at an NYU gallery that I co-organized and curated which was an expansive kind of um, survey of printed matter taken from our, um, from our you know, institutional archives. Uh, Mimi Wheeler was there and Mimi, she was in the audience and, and, um, and she was one of the founders and she chimed in from the audience and it was just you know, great to have her voice, which was um, you know, about, yeah, the nuts and bolts of setting up the system. And, like, I think, you know, Lucy Laporte, there was a little bit of a debate regarding the kind of origin myth of who founded Printed Matter, whose idea was, and stuff like that. But um, I mean, Lu Lucy admittedly, she was very involved in setting up the artist uh, Windows program, and she was also very 
involved in the early publishing um, efforts of printed matter for this short series of, of, of artist books of printed matter did between 1976 and 1979. And she was very engaged in the setting up of printed matter, but I think the systems and all of that uh, was really done by, by Arena. And I think Mimi was in there and Robin White and um, other people um, were kind of did a lot of the, you know, boots on the ground, leg, leg work and stuff, which was an extraordinary amount of work. And just to figure out, you know, not only to get the books in, but to figure out the system on how you're going to receive them, sell them, consign them, make payments. Um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I guess all there's left um, now is other people's knowledge and memories of um, her. And, and this is so typical, I guess, particularly when it comes to the role of women, um, not all of them necessarily directed as much in energy into um, securing their place in history or they just had a family and dropped out of the art world. But Arena's name does come up in, in letters, for instance, at the Archives of American Art, where I believe a lot of the material, printed matters materials are held up to a certain point. And, um, uh, oh, sorry, I see somebody pointing me. In, in one letter, she says, any artist who has a self-published book can bring it in and will distribute it as long as it's an artist's book. Um, and I, I loved that quote. And I was wondering, Max, if you could um, talk about the criteria in the early days to define an artist's book and how that has maybe changed over time. Um, yeah, oh boy, artist's book, smartest book. Um, I listened into a few of the CABC uh, Contemporary Artist Book Conference panels, really wonderful that we're kind of talking about, I think the state of artist book criticism, but um, in um, a common time or you know, is what is the right terminology? And there's, you know, there's a whole line of different possibilities of, is it an artist book, a book book by artist, book work, book art, um, art book, um, uh, art and book form, all these other things. I just come back to artist book as a term of convenience and it's such a um, fluid and, and um, you know, and, and uh, uh, impossible to define kind of, uh, uh, a field of activity because it's not it's not a genre it's not a it's not a specific practice it's not a you know it, it can be so many different things um i guess i kind of come back to the the a, a very simp simplistic kind of division which doesn't always work but it's just useful i think in um um, and for in practical terms is what it isn't. And, you know, a, a conventional art book is a book about art an artist book, the book is the art. But then there's all these different kind of, you know, modes and lineages and possibilities that then that can be. So, you know, if, if art can be anything then an artist book can be anything really. So, yeah, that, no. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but it, I think Irina's position um, um, to include as many, as broad a variety of books as possible really nicely reflects on the idealism of the time and the idea that books um, could be mass produced and really distributed to broad audiences and that they should be in, inexpensive. And um, here's really where I'd like to bring uh, Sam in again and talk about the $48.66 um, uh, as the um, average price of an artist's book at Printed Matter, because I think we really have to clarify and explain that a little further. Um, Sam, would you like to make a start by maybe by telling us what the most expensive book in the catalog is, which already explains <laughs> quite a bit? I mean, <laughs> do you know? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think, I mean, we just, I mean, yeah, I think it's a, it's, a, it's a book called Encyclopedia from Josh Smith, but it's actually 20, it's a 28 volume handmade uh, edition artist book, I think. And yeah. And How much think, is it? I think it's 15,000 or I, it was 15,000. So it's, it's not uh, available anymore. I mean, I, I, I don't think maybe it was just one or I mean, I don't know. Or even maybe two, I don't know, but. I um, think, well, there's, he did this one. I, I think that's the, is that the book? I'd have to look at who we got it from. There was, he did a portfolio for us um, 
um, as part of the uh, the first New York Art Book Fair, um, which I don't think it was. You know, I think it's a it's a it's a it's a unique artist book work. I'm I'm pretty sure that um, it might have been. I forget the. I, I'm not going to say who the publisher was. I think I have an idea, but it, it was a sculpture book. Um, in a case all kind of fabricated or made by Josh as a single piece with a whole bunch of different volumes in it. If I remember correctly, sitting on a stool, kind of a paint, paint splattered stool. Um, but yeah, a very expensive, either unique or maybe an edition of three or three unique editions, something like that. Very small edition. Hmm. Uh, but, but can, you, can you say something like how does a book like that come to printed matter, like, I mean, in the first catalog you showed, like, which is also online, I saw, like this, like this first pamphlet you showed, like the small one, then I think the most expensive book there was like $10 or so. And I think all the others were like around one or 150 or 450 or something, but it was also like, like the $10 book, I think it also had like 250 pages or something, it was quite big. So, I was wondering why could they be so cheap? And I mean, who financed the production there? And then, I mean, the production of this most expensive book is probably cheaper than the production of those $10 book. Um, I mean, I think the, you know, the, the prices of those, you know, $2, 250 and 350, and they reflect the production costs of the book at the time. So an offset book and an addition of a thousand, your unit cost for the book is maybe, a dollar or, or less, and you price it at three fifty or, or or thereabouts. Some of them might well have had subsidization, or probably not just some of them, but quite a bit more. But it is a reflection, and and when you look and see the books, it is a the the, the retail prices are reflections of the cost of production for the regular inventory. Now, how does a book like the Josh Smith book come into inventory? I mean. The, uh, when I saw the average price of 48.66, it seemed quite high to me, but I totally understood why it's that way. And that's that if you would take the cheapest 90%, the, the, the le least expensive 90% of printed matters inventory, the, the average price would probably be like 12 or $15 or something like that. And then if you took the average you know, price of the, of the top, of the highest price, 10%, the price would be in the hundreds or maybe even thousands of dollars. So it is indeed the average price, but it's not a reflection of the of the quantity of how many inexpensive books are, are part of Purchase Matters inventory. And you know, for the most part, you know, we the you know in the in the 19 mid 70s, you know, all of those kind of classic you know artist books that are now you know kind of the collectible coveted ones by artist book collectors and stuff. Um, they were in their in-print prices at that time. So the Lewitts and the Baldessaris and the Rouchers and the Naumans and the Wieners and all those things were literally two two dollars to to ten dollars at the most. And since then, many of them have commanded higher prices. And so that market emerged, you know, whatever ten years into printed matters history in the later '80s and early '90s when those prices started going up. And um, I think I could, you could still get Rouché books when I started a printed matter for about 40 bucks or something like that. Um, so that was before these, some of these spikes kind of started coming in. And I guess, you know, well, <laughs> we, we, we want, you know, our, our, our focus is on in-print books and our, we're, our principles and our mission is very much about accessibility, inclusivity, um, representing the field in its broadest range. And that includes representing the historical kind of history of the of the of, of the of the field as well, which includes books that have now gotten more expensive. So I think it's important that we're able to provide context. It's also really nice to sell one book for a thousand dollars instead of once in a while, instead of having, to, which is equivalent to selling a hundred books at ten dollars. So there is an economic factor in it as well. But um, but but for the most part, the the bulk of our inventory is very much aligned with our, you know, founding, you know, values and mission, I think. And there are, yeah, and then, and then also, of course, the, this, the unique singular one of a kind thing. Yes, there are exceptions for the most part, 95, 99, or probably even more than that percent of our inventory are done in, a, in editions of a hundred or greater or open editions. And then here and there, like, likewise, we don't just carry artist books. We also, you, you look around and you'll see 
t-shirts and posters and postcards and knickknacks and ephemera and stuff like that. Um, we don't accept those kinds of things for our submission program because we don't want to become like a tchotchke shop and a poster store and a t-shirt store, but we are deeply committed to artist books and artist books do make up the largest part of our inventory. Um, that kind of material comes in usually relative to artists who have book practices, artists who are uh, to printed matter programs that are book, book based. Um, and then, and then um, invitationally, occasionally, um, you have almost always coming out of the book publishing community. Um, so we're not, we're not, you know, total book purists, but I must say is that books is what printed matter is about. Artist books is what we're about. It's what, and it's, and it, and it remains the biggest part of our inventory, the biggest part of our mission, the biggest part of our identity and the biggest part of our interest and love and, 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 and focus. Um, this would have been almost my next question because I was curious um, how printed matter I mean the question of pricing leads on to how printed matter actually operates as a business and you talked about this now um, already and I'm sure there's a lot of people in the audience who self-publish or run a small press and we all know what a very precarious field of business this is and there's not or maybe there's never been enough money um, Uh, in it for artists to make a living solely by selling artist books. So the question how one can actually run an artist or a bookshop or a shop running mostly artist books um, is actually really interesting. And um, so the, the, the question being how, how does printed matter survive um, also includes maybe do you get public funding or do you have donors like Solowit who used to, um, I think in the early years, I remember reading in Clive Philpott's book track that he used to um, donate a few drawings whenever the chips were down or something. Um, does that still, how does that work? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a really interesting point because I think it, it comes down to like the almost the essence of artist books as a kind of a utilitarian self-sustaining, you know, form of art, which is, based on a real um, self-sustaining economy. Um, and that is that that was one of the intentions with the founders was that art shouldn't be about genius and scarcity and authenticity. It should be about, um, you know, things produced in real time according to real, real political economies as opposed to kind of the fantasy economies of the hyper rich, um, which is what the high art world and museum and gallery system is much more oriented towards. So this was like an art for the people and a, and a production and distribution system um, based on that. And so I really, it, and I think there's even, it's in, it's, it's maybe there's a literature record, but also it's within, I think our, you know, within Printed Matters document, um, archive documents is that they they really thought that the that it could be sustainable printed matter could be sustainable is that that was like this model of of economic you know you have your raw materials you have your industrial manufacturing process you have your workers you have your your labor your your artists and 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 the book is priced accordingly and everyone gets paid accordingly um and it sustains itself and um as lucy lepard noted in, in an essay, I think around 1978, which followed a very um, hopeful and almost idealistic um, essay at the, as, at the time of Printed Matters founding in which she, I think some of her quotes about artist books and supermarkets and mm -hmm. newspaper stands and things like that might've come from. Um, she wrote a much more kind of pessimistic essay. It's in the critical anthology that Joan Lyons published, mm -hmm. a follow-up that's like notes that, oh, the problem with artist books and accessibility is that there are art or contemporary artist books, it's contemporary art and contemporary art is not accessible except to a kind of educated and relatively class privileged you know, few. And so the prospect of selling, printing an industrial production of a thousand copies means you have to have a thousand people who are willing to pay $2.50, the price at the time for something that is completely obscure and meaningless to them. And so it really was a matter of kind of art being uh, in the domain of more privileged classes. And I think that also led to Lucy's, you know, disillusionment with the art world and some of the con conceptual art, kind of rat what she cited as radical potentials through the dematerialization and kind of decommodification of the art form, um, but being eventually trumped by the mark, so to speak, by the marketplace 
um, and absorbed into kind of like capitalist, you know, um, culture. Um, so, let me interrupt you, Max. Sorry. <laughs> so, um, but thank you. Um, just before it's too late and we'll open for the Q&A, um, just there's this question that I'm sure interests a lot of people. If you could please run us um, through the process again of the open submission policy and if you could give some insight into how um, the actual selection process um, is working. Say I would be a young and promising publisher and I'm sending you my a review copy of my first book. Um, who actually gets to decide if you're distributing it at Printed Matter and um, how does this selection process really work? So okay, I'll tell you that, but I'll, I'll, <laughs> I'll, 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 I'll just answer your last question because I went off in that tangent, which is very related to the answer. What the founders found was that Printed Matter is not, because of the, those problems that Lucy Lepard cited, Printed Matter and artist books cannot be self-sustaining, is that they have to be subsidized. And that's when Printed Matter decided to turn into a nonprofit was because of the, um, that there needed to be additional funding for this kind of material that was too obscure for large audiences to buy. It remains, I just want need to say that it, it remains an internal contradiction, I think, of contemporary artist books um, that you know, is, is a problem and, and continues to this day. But also at the same time, artist books are incredibly successful in, um, in that they do proliferate, they do circulate, they are inexpensive, they are affordable, and they do to an extent self-sustain themselves in some way. So it's not a either one or the other kind of picture. Okay, sorry, I just wanted to connect. No, 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 I mean this, this yeah, it, it, it is interesting and it interests me um, be also because Irina Fonzan, if I remember correctly, she was um, opposed in the early um, years um, to um, apply for nonprofit status because she was afraid that the NAA, the National Endowments of the Arts would actually interfere um, with some of the obs more obscure material. And um, it's interesting how then there's a shift um, when you actually applied for nonprofit status. And um, yeah, I think it was really survival based and that there, it, was a, it was a shift in perspective because people were a distrustful of the government funding and, and the kind of influence that could exert and stuff like that, but also, um, you know, also it, that it was also due partly to not the fact that they needed the funds. They couldn't pay the rent and pay the staff and pay the different expenses on the revenue created from the books alone. And that remains true to this day. And I think if you go to the New York and LA art book fairs and browse through this just incredible array of different kinds of independent and experimental and creative publishing practices, um, you know, for the most part, many of them are have some kind of subsidy and or are done through a lot of out of pocket um, labor of love um, resourceful partnerships and other kinds of things. So there's, but I think there, it is a problem that the new generations of publishers are very much grappling with is how do we make this? And some with success have found different models for economically sustaining publishing practices. So it's not off the table and there are, and I see like the, the, the possibility of that, I think is kind of palpable when you go through those book fairs and see this, the huge range of different peoples and innovative and creative thinking that's going into how can we do this thing that we have to do, which is, you know, creative artist book publishing. Um, regarding the submissions, just really quickly. So yes, there was a time when actually when the only qualification was if it's an artist book, then we take it. Well, what the hell is an artist book? And then at a certain point, there's a capacity question. So um, I think in the past, there might've been directors of who might've decided what comes in. There might've been collaborations. Since I was at Printed Matter, I think the director was at first doing it, and then it kind of opened up to a committee of a review committee. And recently we, um, you know, which is fixed, but it's based on changing staff. And then recently, right now, um, the, the committee rotates. So everyone on staff is welcome to join the committee um, in rotation. So we get as many eyes and perspectives on the books as we can. and. At this point, I think we're taking in roughly about 30% of the submitted books. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So if my book, fictional book is accepted on consignment and I'll send three or five copies, what happens next if they're sold? What share do I get? From... We basically, if we work on a 50% consignment basis and we calculate and make payments on a quarterly basis. Yeah, so. Um... And we, I mean, I think we sell, 
I forget what the eighty thousand dollar eighty thousand bucks a year we distribute about over two hundred thousand dollars in consignments a year to artists to consignment. How many? Can you repeat the number again? Um, I have to look at the quantity of books. Maybe it's in the fifty to eighty thousand, or is it more? But the amount of money we disperse to artists is about is close to a quarter of a million dollars annually on consignment payments. Yeah. Yeah, it's crazy because I just like the book was kind of like I planned to finish it in 2018 already. And then I just found an old screenshot of the online inventory and the number of artist books that were there online. And it was like, I think 7,900 or something. And then, I mean, like, like exactly two years, I think it was this March 7th or something in 2018. And now it's like uh, March 11th and it's like 11,000 books so it's my I like it's so it's like 3000 books like that went into like printed matter like in those like three years a bit crazy but and it I also think reflects of, in your book yeah um, but i mean in my book there's just like i think it's, it's like close this. to 10000 so it means like in, just in the last year there's like already 2000 more i mean it's pretty lots of books <laughs> um yeah, I mean, I guess a last question and then we should open it up um, to Sam then um, really to end this. Um, um, there's uh, film stills at the beginning of and the end of the, of the book. Um, and um, I just wanted to ask you if you could say something um, there by Chris Marker and Alain René um, and they really wonderfully, I think, frame the content um, as sort of visual references. And um, perhaps you could just explain why you included them in the in the catalog. I, do you want to show them? Or, yeah, cool. That's I mean, the first one. Like just like Chris a short, Like just a short time before I was like finishing the book, or like I was done with editing it. There was like in Berlin, there was the Berlinale, which is like the film festival. And they showed like a newly restored version of Chris Marker's film, like of the series, like Calling from Paris about the publisher and leftist intellectual activist, uh, Francois, Ma Francois Masperou, uh, who, was, who was running like a, a publishing and publishing house and a bookshop in Paris and uh, was for example, publishing uh, Franz Fanon or like Che Guevara, for example, or like decolonial authors at the time, also from French colonies, but also from abroad. And then this kind of connected to an older like source of like inspiration of mine, which is like a film from Alain René about the French National Library. It's called like uh, All the World's, what is it called? All the World's Memories in English. And it's like a portrait of the National Library in France and the organization of knowledge in it. So, uh, so those kind of two different uh, concepts of institutions kind of um, connected to printed matter in a way, I thought it's kind of also showing what printed matter is about. On the one hand, like this political implications that publishing brings uh, in the case of this uh, Mas Peru publishing house or like in this person of Mas Peru and on the other hand this kind of need to build up like a database of or like a um, yeah I mean a representative picture of what an artist book is at the moment somehow what I also think is uh, what printed matter does in the case of the National Library of France that I mean that like every national library, they collect basically everything that is published in this one country. So it's like, this is kind of what connects somehow the idea of printed matter like on this two levels, which is kind of really nice and, and connects it to the initial idea somehow. It's Yeah, it's, a, it's yeah. almost the same. This is also like a who is who in self-publishing. Everyone, a lot of the names in there are quite known to us from fairs and yeah, it's a book of friends, I guess, as well. 
um, but also a lot of unknown artists, as I, as I said, I think in the early 70s, I was so um, amazed to read so many names by particularly women artists from the, um, in, the, in the very early section that I had never heard of. And, and that's why I think it is a great um, resource to do, to do further research and um, even though not an academic publication. Um, so, but yeah, let's see if there's questions in the um, chat in the Q&A, if you have more questions, please post them in the Q&A. Um, I have one by June. Uh, hi, June. Um, she asked, um, <laughs> every archive has its missing spots or gaps. I'm interested how Sam works with his with these gaps in the printed matter archive in his book. Um, Sam, you said that you didn't edit, but gaps are highlighted. No, she's asking if the gaps are highlighted. Actually, no, actually, the gaps are, I mean, not highlighted at all. It's like more, I mean, the first book in the, in the list of the book is from 2001. It's just because somehow all out of stock items just move to the beginning of the book. It's somehow, yeah, it's actually the first page is like more or less new books or like mixed up with 80s or some with, uh, with books from the 80s. So it's kind of, uh, yeah, actually it wasn't, I mean, it wasn't possible for me to even detect the gaps because I didn't know about the functionality of how the online inventory system actually worked until I spoke to Max. So it's kind of different to, I mean, also to, to follow this chronology in some ways also even it's also, as I, I mean, it's kind of impossible for me to kind of follow it because I could just, from some books, I could say, hey, this is from the 80s, this is from the 90s, this is 2000. So it makes sense somehow, but then suddenly you get a book like on the second page of the recent books, I mean, on the last pages, then you find an Ed Rouché book and it's like from, I mean, from the 80s or 70s and you, you think like, what? what is that doing here? But of course, like the printed matter online inventory is like a shop inventory. And if this book is still available, it is it is of interest to bring it up to the recent books and somehow advertise it there. So it's kind of, um, yeah. It's, just to add to that, it's, I think it's the, so it's the, it's the earliest received, right? That was the list you're looking at? Earliest received. So what yeah. it is, is it's like when we receive a shipment of that book, the earliest time that the, the last, the earliest time that we last received a shipment of that book. And so you'll get a book, you'll have a recent book right up, right in there because it used to have a really old ID, but then it was received recently. And then there'll be a, a vintage book. There'll be a vintage book like the Ida Appleberg. We've received those books since then, but it had a different, it had a different inventory record. So it's recorded elsewhere, and but that particularly that particular book was last received in 1986. You know, even though it might have circulated through our inventory at later times, but under a different record. I don't know if that makes sense. Anyway, it's very, it's very. That's why I was so bewildering about and 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 curious about the whole thing to me it was like, how is this ordered? <laughs> you know, and then yes. when I go to your search, <laughs> your, your data mining model then I understand it. And that's, it's kind of like a mathematical problem. Like, like how does this relate to history and chronology and stuff like that? It's a mind twister in other words. But anyway. I'm so happy you brought up Ida Applebrock, Max, because um, there's something I wanted to, to also note um, about her on um, page two of Sam's catalog. Um, there's a list of her um, booklets, you know, she did a lot of these booklets, which always had a performance at the end of the title. And um, just seeing them listed like this in the catalog, um, it creates this really beautiful, almost, you know, very poetic dialogue between the titles. And you can read uh, one after the other, um, starting with, I feel sorry for you, a performance. I mean it, a performance. I pretend to know, and so on and so forth, going to, you'll see a performance, you'll what? So it's like this little story in itself that you really can rediscover just by reading um, the titles that are listed. Um, uh, it's, on, it's on page two, that's one of my favorites. And also, um, if you're not familiar with Ida Applebrook's um, work, there's, um, she also, 
uh, had an exhibition in this window, um, in the window installations um, that you can look at if you go to Printed Matter, um, or at least one installation view is on the website um, on about, and I think it's um, mission and, what's it called, mission and history. Um, and then it's the second picture which shows uh, one of her drawings, very beautiful on the shop window at 7 Lisbonard Street. Um, and uh, I'm not, I mean, I, yeah, I'm just curious if uh, Max, you could say uh, one more thing about the shop window um, this place because this seems such a very timely format in, in pandemic times. Um, it's quite beautiful. So so why how, how many of these exhibitions were there and, and why was it discontinued at some point? So yeah, so Lucy Lepard curated the windows at Lisbon Art Street from I think 1978 to 1989 when they moved to Soho. And it was a very, it might've been 1977 was the first one even. And it was a very deliberate month long exhibition program, window installation program where she invited artists, most of whom had artist book practices or art, some form of artist publishing practices to do window installations. And while, you know, I mean, some very, you know, whatever, uh, artists like, like um, Jenny Holzer, Barbara Kruger, Richard Prince, um, uh, 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 had had their first, whether well, it was one of their first, you know, public exhibitions was in Printed Matters windows, also in Franklin Furnace's windows. Um, and, uh, but also it, it was really, was a, uh, Lucy really, she wanted windows that political art and, and social topical art. So art about what was going on at the time. And so there were many activist artists, um, you know, lesser known who were doing topical pieces about gentrification, domestic violence, um, nuclear armament, um, uh, uh, the secret wars in Latin America, um, um, uh, immigration, um, uh, a whole range of different domestic and international political issues. And, um, and it was interesting how those kind of, you know, second generation conceptual pictures generation artists intertwined in there, there the fields overlap, but they were including Lucy Lepard's, you know, um, a uh, pad, a uh, political art documentation mm -hmm. and distribution project um, and other things was that was another forum for them. So it was really, a, uh, and, uh, and it was deliberately, this is public art. This is, they applied for a grant. There's a wonderful little story that's told in the grant application where they applied for a very modest grant for material support for the Windows program, Nancy Lynn at the time with Lucy Lepard in conversation. And the, and the, and the, and the granting agency said, well, do you do openings? And they said, F no, we don't do openings. This isn't this isn't about having some kind of schnazzy art thing with champagne and stuff like that. This is art for the people on the street. There's a postal, it's for the postal workers, for the garment industry workers, for the for the other working class people who are the pedestrians who pass by this thing. This is not for the art elite. So we do not do we do not do openings. This is art, public art. And they did and they didn't get the grant. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> but anyway, so that's that, that's the, like whatever. I think it's a it's a good it's a good story. Yeah, that, where where yeah. a good principle we should continue to follow. Yeah, and maybe you should pick up on it for your store now. But yeah, right on. <laughs> <laughs> um, there's one more question in the Q and A um, by Zara Umlis. Um, she says, "I love the arbitrariness of the price of Sam's book." But I noticed um, since it's an average dollar amount that does not account for inflation, the book should actually cost more. Um, now, uh, <laughs> to, uh, to the actual questions, um, Max, can you talk about the various factors that have contributed to Printed Matters valuation of artist books over the decade, decades? And, to Sam, can you talk about your own artistic perspective on the concept of value? Um, maybe starting with Max and the valuation of artist books um, over the decades, the factors that have contributed to it. The valuations meaning like the price? I guess what why it's become more expensive, but it could mean something else. I mean, Sarah, if, if you're feeling misunderstood, please um, give us a shout. I mean, if it's if it is regarding price, I feel like many of the contemporary and newer generation of artists, book makers, are really motivated by the same things that other people were, and that they wanted to produce a art reproducible, published, you know, in in published form. 
um, you know, for all those same reasons, and that therefore they're guided by the same ideas of making things affordable and hopefully having them reflect, you know, their actual production costs and be kind of, you know, real economy based. Um, as far as the stuff that starts getting expensive, it's just simply to the, um, you know, at the pressure of, of, of market forces like scarcity and, and, uh, and, and, you know, desirability and things like that, according to the, to the collecting classes, I guess. Um, which drive yeah. prices upwards. Because it's really, yeah, it's really just the old books that are um, so expensive now, the ones I mean, being... Yeah, and things done in limited editions and it sells out, or sometimes recent books can be super popular and become, go out of print very quickly. So they're not, don't really have the patina of, you know, of, um, of age and they still start, you know, fetching higher, higher prices. Sam? <laughs> Yeah, um, yeah. <laughs> I would. I mean, probably it's also about the price. Maybe I don't. Um, yeah, I mean, like also because you mentioned that it's too cheap somehow. <laughs> I thought it's. Uh, and maybe I mean, some. I mean, the book of the Kunsthalle, for example, it was like just an edition of five, so it was quite expensive just because the production cost was super high. So. One book of the Kunsthalle show cost uh, 500 euros. So um, a book here, I mean, it doesn't make sense to make it more expensive. It was even kind of, I even annoyed Max by using the <laughs> most expensive books to uh, calculate a higher price for myself. So I, mean, <laughs> um, um, I don't know. I mean, the next book is probably more, maybe a more expensive one again. I don't know. Maybe not. I, what are you going to sell the book for in Germany? Because it's from what I, I think you're not having any distribution in, in Europe yet. And you, so if somebody wants the book in Europe, you probably have to write to Sam as um, shipping fees to Europe from the US are still <clears throat> somewhat <laughs> difficult to afford. <laughs> um, but uh, are you going to sell it say in, in, in Berlin for, for what, not 48 euros, I guess. What do you know? I think the, I mean, I mean, to me, it was important to kind of just distribute it by printed matter because it conceptually made sense to me to not use any other distribute, distributors because it was kind of a, a work for that play somehow. I mean, the Kunsthalle book, I also not distrib distributed by someone else. It was also just available through myself. So, and uh, so, I mean, I think so I guess. the price here is, I think I calculated something like 41 or 42 euros. I mean, it just took the euro price that was equivalent, like the exact euro price that is equivalent at the day someone buys the book. <laughs> so it's probably also quite a, a tricky number. Or you could just do a new project and not distribute it here at all. You, you would have to pick, but what is the European equivalent to printed matter? I don't think there is that one bookshop. Um, and I think I, I think A.A. Bronson talked about one in Amsterdam or something that was even before, like a really old one. Other books and so? Or? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, I mean, Bookie Bookie, probably not not too small, but yeah, other books and so is what might have been. Yes, awesome. Yeah, um, yeah motto. Yeah, I mean, this shipment thing, um, Max, that's really something that came up um, when I talked to a lot of friends after the, the first virtual art book fair happened, um, what, two weeks ago. And um, there was some someone who suggested that after the fair, one could collect all of the um, orders coming in from Europe uh, and somehow or the other way around and then ship it over in, at once. Are there any such, do you think about any such um, strategies or? Yeah there, are a really lot, a yeah, there were a lot of conversations around that because it, it really is like shipping expenses. And then also the fact that, you know, that with 400 exhibitors, you know, you had to have four and if you wanted to get things from various people you had to do it through separate shopping carts and stuff like that we grappled with consolidation for a long time and actually reached out and had conversations with a bunch of the different participants and we kind of couldn't come up with a 
with a workable model, but we're aware of the problem. And I think it would be as we, you know, we'll look, look for, you know, ways to try to, that would make sense and, and, and yeah, it'd be economical. Um, yeah. Great. Yeah. Um, last question by Dana is just very briefly, um, Samuel, are you doing the graphic design by yourself? Uh, and... Yes. <laughs> <I'm not sure laughs> that's not, like the right answer. To... <laughs> and I think the question she asked in addition has already been answered in the beginning, how you think of the book as an exhibition. You kind of talked about that a bit earlier. Um, yeah, and Sarah also, uh, Sarah Umles, Umles uh, she also um, added um, that her comment uh, was a bit tongue in cheek, um, uh, but yeah, about the price, um, but also just broader concepts of value as it relates to the art world. Um, but I think we've talked about this um, now. All right. Um, is just there any regarding yeah. value as it relates to the art world? Is that yeah, the artist book economy is based on social use value. Is that if the if the price of the book is based on its kind of if it's material production and also it's it's you know the usefulness and you need a book you need to be able to read it you need to be able to learn from it you need to be able to exchange it and things like that you do not need a, a work of art a painting uh for a million dollars that that has no help that helps no one but books help help they help us and they help they help us help each other so that's what value the artist books reflect social use and, and high expensive artworks uh, reflect social um, misuse, basically. That would be my value statement. That <laughs> would, would already be a beautiful end, but there's one more question and we have three minutes, so we must be quick. Um, by Solomon Lawrence, I think he, uh, he wrote the short text for your, um, for your online, for, for, the, for the catalog on Printed Matters website, no? Um, so Solomon asks, um, you have talked a lot about trying to bring art to a broader audience than just the privileged inner circle of the art world. There's a kind of ambivalence in this book on this topic because it seems to me it is difficult to read this book without any knowing who these artists are or without knowing what images are being referred to. I'm curious to know what you think about the relationship between text and image in relation to this strategy of democratization of art. Uh, to, it's a question to me, yeah. I'm assuming. Yeah. Um, <laughs> hi, Solomon. <laughs> uh, yeah, um, tricky questions. Yes, of, of course, I mean, I think it's not like, a, a, I mean, it's quite obvious that this book is not going to be read by someone who's not interested in printed matter or anything like that at all. And I mean, this kind of, I mean, you wrote in this text that it's kind of like, that every like title and artist opening is opening up this imagine, imaginary kind of picture or is able to opening up this imaginary picture, but therefore you have to know this kind of person somehow or, or whatever, but also nonetheless, this, uh, you don't know this person somehow, some titles at least also work in a different way than probably, but of course, I mean, it's still kind of a big problem that class and art doesn't go together that well. I mean, and I'm, I'm not sure if this book is a solution to that. I'm afraid, no. <laughs> not a good um, final but I'm, Yeah, but I'm, I mean, I'm curious though, if somebody will actually um, read this from beginning to end uh, if you do so, please let us know. I failed, <laughs> and I remember because there was um, Lucy Lepar talked about uh, her six years book uh, in that it's impossible to actually read from beginning to end. And then some artists wrote to her, I think that he did. <laughs> and um, this is, um, and it's, I think it would be actually quite, quite worth it to do. Um, so if, if, if someone ever <laughs> has the time now <laughs> during this uh, pandemic, um, uh, please do let us know. And, um, and I think that's, um, that's it from me. Um, if there's anything you want to add, this is the moment. If not, we're going to shut it off very soon.
buy the book. <laughs> buy the book. We actually sold out, but we'll be getting a restock <laughs> soon. So we're really happy to have it here. And it was really wonderful to join both of you in this conversation. Yeah. Thanks. Well, thank thanks to you, Max, too. Thank you, Max. Thank you, um, Sam. Thank you to Print It Matter for hosting this. Um, this was such a beautiful opportunity and really the best best place um, for this program, for this event to happen in. So um, it's already bedtime here for us. So I say good night, have a good rest of the day um, uh, and talk to you all soon. Thank you. And thanks Thank everyone you. who came and attended. I hope, I hope it was good for you as well. Thank you. Bye. Hi, thanks for joining us tonight.